2021 has been a breakthrough year for mental health. I know you're probably going to raise your eyebrows and go, what is she on about? Mental health issues have always been in top sports. High level athletes have always suffered from depression, anxiety, panic attacks, self doubts, you name it, not just tennis, any sport. What is new is that we talk about it and that is a breakthrough. And that will help a lot of players, a lot of people become better athletes because they can finally feel okay about themselves and they can finally feel okay with seeking help. My name is Micah Babel. I'm a former top 30 WTA pro. I played on tour for 10 years and I've struggled with mental health issues. So much so that at times I was not able to get out of bed. But you make yourself, I made myself because 25, 30 years ago, the stigma was just too big. And also the knowledge around these issues were not as advanced as today. Of course, now today, I know that I had depression, but I really didn't know about it. I didn't admit it to myself, nor was anybody else around me educated enough to see, oh, these are the signs for depression. We know that now a lot better. And of course, now I get the help that I need. And we can talk about that now at the highest level of sports. Of course, we all know Naomi Osaka didn't play tournaments last year because she didn't enjoy what she used to love. We now have Bianca Andreescu not traveling to the Australian Open because she is dealing with mental health issues. So what are really the things that can trigger depression, anxiety, panic, the demons how Dominic Thiem terms it, because he has also talked about that. Maybe not quite as much as in detail. Nick Kyrgios actually opened up and admitted that he was seeing a psychologist because he was dealing with depression. So we're turning more towards the, yes, let's talk about this and let's educate ourselves. And to me as a coach, that's especially important because if I see certain things, certain behaviors in players, then I know what it is and I can offer help, something that I didn't have. And I'm thinking that a lot of players on tour still not have necessarily. So one of the things that a lot of people do not understand, especially when they say, well, you should suck it up, you're getting millions, uh, you know, whatever you're, you know, you have all these endorsements and contracts and so, so on and so forth. That is a minority. So think about that. If you are making it into world class, you have been in this highly competitive environment now from age eight, nine, ten on. You are traveling already pretty much full time, especially here in the US where you have the option to homeschool more and more kids, juniors or their parents are choosing that. So at that age, when you are starting to experience stress for the first time, where usually you have a more uh, broader support system when you're in school to learn how you could deal with stressors, they're already by themselves. And every single child, every single one of these children has a lot of stress because they all know that traveling costs something, that the coach costs something, that the equipment costs something. Patrick Moritoglu just said the other day that the most important thing a junior player needs is financial support. And yes, as a kid, I knew when my dad or my mom or whoever was traveling with me put the credit card down when we had to stay at a hotel. Now, I traveled mostly regional when I played and I got better. But now these kids, they're traveling to the Orange Bowl, they're traveling to the US Open, they're traveling to Le Petit Us somewhere in Europe. They're traveling more to some extent than I was when I was a pro. So you start in that pressure cooker without a lot of tools. And that 
can then just go on until you're hitting the more big time. And the big time, a lot of people have a picture of from social media, especially now when, you know, the pros are all heading out to Australia. You see, uh, for instance, I saw a post from Diego Schwartzman on a private jet with four, five, six, seven other people. That is the number, whatever he is now, 12, 13, 14, whatever. He has the money to do that. Novak Djokovic, Nadal, Federer, Ash Barty, Sabalenka, whatever the top 10, 15, 20 are, they can afford that. They can travel with a trainer, with a coach, with a hitting partner, with a doctor, with a nutritionist. But if you go further down the rankings, it dries up pretty quickly how much money you have and how many people that can support you, you can actually have traveling with you. Now, if you make it into big time, you are starting out, unless you are a phenom like Emma Raducanu, who literally plays one tournament and boom, is in the top 20. And she also had to start a little slower and a little lower, but I'm exaggerating here for a point. Unless you're one of those superstars that really starts playing their first tournaments and within half a year or a year makes it to the tournaments where you are starting to make the big bucks, you are playing in places that are not the greatest, that are not the safest, that sometimes don't have running hot water, where it's difficult to get the type of food that you're used to, where it's difficult to travel to. You have to travel by yourself. Maybe your mom comes with you or your brother comes with me. I have my brother traveling with me sometimes just so that I had somebody traveling with me because I couldn't afford a coach. You're going to places where people don't speak your language. People don't like you. People don't want you to win. Where you have referees doing a little bit of home cooking for the hometown uh, hero, where the crowd is against you. And unless you're you know, catapulting up in the rating, you're losing a lot, a lot. I was 27 in the world and I lost more matches than I won. Now that had also something to do with my injuries, which I will come back to later. But you're losing a lot because that's just how it goes. And tennis is the weirdest sport with as much media scrutiny, with as much earning possibilities, where you're on court by yourself the entire time. Yes, okay, you can play doubles. But at the end of the day, there's only very few teams that really play as a team year in, year round. Oftentimes, you just pair up with whoever it is, and that player may not also be the most supportive if you're playing terribly. So that's coming to it. So knowing that from my own career, I can see why so many people drop out along that way and or are not even taking those steps. Has technology helped players stay in touch with their support system? Yes, absolutely. When I played, my mom used to fax me the front page of her hometown uh, newspaper to Australia so that I had something that reminds me of home. I had bills of $200, $300, $400 per week of faxing because you could not afford to actually call. Now, of course, you know, you have FaceTime, you have Zoom, you have everything. So at least that helps. And what a lot of players choose to do is they're now working with sports psychologists and stay in touch with them because it is a grueling sport. You are traveling almost nonstop. And again, not necessarily always in the nicest circumstances if you're a little lower in the rankings. Now, those are the issues that you have in the beginning of your career, when you're starting to come up the rankings. Now, when you're a little bit more established, the pressures start to change. Now you're not chasing, hopefully, for endorsements anymore. Now you're not uh, having to worry as much about the financials, but now you're worrying about living up to your own expectations. 
and the expectations of your coach, your family, your federation, the media, your fans, whoever it is, everybody in their mom will have an opinion about your performance. And social media has really, really shown us that there are a lot of unappetizing people out there. Let's say it that way. A lot of people who hide behind the screens and just aim to rip you into pieces when you're not doing well. So add it to all your own self-doubts. You have all these other people telling you something. And whether some of these pressures, when I say from your family or your coach or whatever it is, whether they're realistic or true even, whether they really think that you should be doing certain things, is completely irrelevant. It only matters what goes in here. And that is the most devastating sometimes. So yes, I had the days when I didn't want to get up, but I made myself. What if it becomes so debilitating that you actually cannot physically get up anymore? Or you have panic attacks. This is where I always recommend that you watch the documentary from Marty Fish, because that really shows you at that level okay, I, this is not really as stressful anymore because I've already, you know, built my career. I've already, you know, I don't have to worry about retirement, whatever. The pressures are real. And I know a lot of people are like, oh my God, yeah, but they're getting so much money. It doesn't matter. Money cannot buy you mental health. So watch that and really see, go and deep dive into somebody who really, really struggled. Now, are there other coping mechanisms with uh, these mental health issues, of course, other than seeking help? Yes, there are very, very unhealthy coping mechanisms from disordered eating to substance abuse to drinking to whatever. That is also a fact of top athletics. And yeah, are there certain things that you know people should not do? Of course. But what if you have not learned any other coping mechanisms and or you don't have the resources to seek a mental health professional? Now, the WTA is offering this help now, which is fantastic. And that's how it needs to be. But again, if you're in this weird gap from coming onto tour and you're playing on smaller challengers and ITFs and all that, you may not have access. So those are the stressors that you are having when you're playing. Your day is scheduled out if you're one of the top stars with uh, media, with sponsors, with contract stuff. And that only is going to be more and more and more and more when you're getting better. So from chasing these things that you initially wanted and needed, they're now becoming an obligation. And again, everybody will have an opinion on what you do what you wear, what you eat, who you're going out with, who you're practicing with, who your coach is, and who you, it is insane. Those are the stressors you deal with while you're playing. Now comes the time when you're done with playing. And that is also a time when a lot of us struggle with mental health issues. Because think about that. I said from eight, nine, 10 years old, you are the tennis player. I was known as Micah, the tennis player. I knew myself as Micah, the tennis player. So what now when you are done with playing tennis? And especially when that decision is not your own. And I'm talking about injury. Now, for instance, Bianca Andreescu has been more than unlucky with her injury history. I mean, that woman has torn up the scene in, 99, uh, in, 20, in 2019 and kind of sort of barely has played since because of COVID, but mostly because of injuries. So you're at this super high and now your body doesn't allow you to just go on. Your body is basically saying like, nah, screw you. I'm not going to do this anymore. So it's bad enough to deal with injuries when you're playing, but it is even worse when you have a career ending injury. And that I know about. 
because at some point you are Micah the tennis player and then you are Micah the what? What else do I know other than tennis? This is what I've been doing my entire life. My entire identity is wrapped around being a tennis player. And a lot of times one confuses their value as a human being with how well or badly one is doing on tour. That is wrapped into all of that as well. You're only a good human being when you're also doing well because I'm a tennis player. If I'm not playing tennis well, what am I? So thankfully, I always had something to fall back onto, getting my education. So that got me into a certain direction that gave me a path. And then yes, I got stuck with tennis because I still love it and I still love teaching. But there are certainly a lot of former pros that struggle with that because you may not have proper schooling. Not every country really forces you to continue to go to school and or forces you to really have a quality education. So what do you do then? So that is the stage when a lot of us also struggle. And again, if you didn't make it into, let's say, the top 40 and stay there for more than three, four, five years, you are not financially done. Not for a long time. So you still have to do something, but what are you going to do? So those are all the issues that a lot of people don't necessarily know about. But what is the phenomenal thing now is that we started talking about it, that I feel more comfortable and more confident putting this side of myself out on freaking YouTube so that maybe a parent listens, maybe another player listens, maybe a coach listens and goes like, oh, wait, this is either how I feel, this is how my kid feels, this is how another player feels, a teammate, somebody I coach, let me ask some questions. Let me educate myself a little bit more about what the signs are of depression, of anxiety, of panic attacks. Because the one thing that we athletes do really well is we hide weaknesses really, really well. We don't admit them to ourselves for the longest part. And up until now, we didn't do a great job admitting them to others. So it is a phenomenal opportunity that some tennis players have opened up to us, and of course, athletes from other sports as well. But I do think that Naomi Osaka, Simone Biles, hello, Micah, don't forget her, of course, have been the vanguards in that we can now have these conversations. And because of that, 2021 has been the breakthrough year.